first of all, we thank you for being here. Um, you are with Mr. John Lanchester, author of non-fiction and fiction books like Capital. And this book was awarded with Santiago de Compostela's Casino Prize last year. And we are students from IMB and the book club that uh, have read Capital. And we would like to ask you a few questions. Please. OK. So. Um, which meaning did you want to give to Capital when you chose the title? Is it polysemic? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great privilege and a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize that Capital in English is unique because it has a double, a double sense. Um, and. Um, I was, I was, so I, for me, I wanted both meanings. I wanted capital in the sense of accumulated economic capital, um, and also capital in the sense of, um, you know, the, the capital city of a state. The capital city? city of a state. Of a state. Of what? Of a state. Okay. El, eh, para mí el, el significado de capital era un significado polisémico, como en inglés, que tiene dos significados, que es por una parte la acumulación de riqueza, la acumulación de capital y eh, los pecados capitales del Estado, digamos. Um, and then um, it became, I had to think about it more when the book was translated into other languages, um, uh, because publishers in other countries faced a choice of whether they went, which basically they had to decide which meaning they chose, whether they chose the place or, the, or capital in the, um, in the more economic sense. Um, and um, the, most common, the most common title um, for publishers who didn't like capital uh, was the name of the street. They called it Peeps Road. Um, and actually, funnily enough, I felt, um, uh, quite a, I felt a sense of loss about, a loss about that. I felt that a lot was being left out by just giving it the, the geographical location. I, I, um, I much prefer what um, Anna Grammer did here in Spain and uh, the German publisher did as well, which is give it, you know, risk giving it the other title. Eh, bueno, decíamos que entonces eh, cuando se traduce eh, capital a los diferentes idiomas de los países en los que es editado, los editores ahí sí que tienen que realizar un, un, una elección, porque tienen que decidir si mantener el título original capital o si cambiarlo por otra acepción. De hecho, en algunos países se cambió por Pipi's Road, que es el título de la calle donde se desarrolla la novela, pero él piensa que esto es una, una cierta pérdida de sentido original y le gustó mucho la decisión de Anagrama en España de mantener el título original capital. Um, and it was a particular risk in Germany because if you call a book Kapital in German, they think there's going to be a, uh, you know, a 150-year-old dead man with a huge beard. Um, uh, and, but the, and the other place where they changed the title, um, there's an old joke in England. We say that um, in France, all titles of everything could be applied to a relationship between three people. That basically all French works of art, all films. All stories are about you know, two men in love with the same women or two women in love with the same man. Uh, and the joke was in France, um, I thought they were going to call it Peeps Road. And then when the book came in, it was called Cher Voisin, Dear Neighbours, which of course would apply perfectly to the other kind of story. Por ejemplo, en Alemania la cuestión era que, claro, si, le, si titulas una obra capital, corres el riesgo de que se identifique inmediatamente con la obra de, de Marx, de este señor de 150 años, lo cual era un tanto peligroso. Y luego también en Francia, eh, porque hay una cierta, un cierto chiste en Inglaterra que cualquier obra literaria en Francia está siempre relacionada con una relación de trío, una historia de amor entre dos hombres y una mujer, o dos mujeres y un hombre, etc. Entonces también se corría este peligro y por eso en francés se, se tradujo como Cher, eh, como queridos vecinos, lo cual también tiene gracia, porque de alguna manera sí que aplica un poco a esta, a esta broma del trío en Francia. Pero um, the, the, the larger point about the, the, the pun is English is full of, has more double meanings than most languages, because it has a, a bigger vocabulary. So um, it's often an issue in translation that you have, um, you know, things with two or three, me, you know, two or three meanings converging, and it's actually... Um, it's a problem all the time with translations. 
Es cierto que en el inglés hay muchísimos dobles significados debido al hecho de que el inglés tiene un vocabulario enorme y muchas veces los traductores nos vemos eh, afectados por este problema de decidir entre los dos o incluso tres eh, significados que puede tener un vocablo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, which is the symbolic value of Pepe's Road? Um, I, I didn't have a specific symbolism in the title, though um, Samuel Pepys was a very important um, diary keeper of the, of the 17th century. And um, he, when he, he worked at the Navy office, and when he retired from his job, he moved to what was then a small village outside London called Clapham, which is now part of London. And that's basically where the book is set. So it was, it was meant as a tiny gesture to, you know, the very small number of people who know or care that that was where the place is, because the place is never named in the book. So that was like a tiny insider gesture. Bueno, el motivo es que de alguna manera quería rendir homenaje a Samuel Pepys, que fue un cronista, eh, de, creo que del siglo XIX, que trabajó en el Almirantazgo en Londres y cuando se retiró de, de su trabajo se fue a vivir a una zona de, de Londres que antes no era Londres en sí, sino que era un pequeño pueblo que estaba anexo a Londres y que hoy forma ya parte de Londres y que es Clapham. Y de hecho el libro donde está situado es en, esa, en ese barrio de Londres que es Clapham y era como una especie de, de, de broma o de chiste para enterados de que realmente era ahí donde solía vivir el cronista Samuel Pepys. Um, but and and I wanted to I didn't think of it in terms of symbolism so much as trying to um, pick an area that had a lot of the things I wanted to describe. I wanted to describe this thing about lots of different kinds of people from lots of different places living together but not really forming a community just they they happen to live in the same place um, but my experience of of city life is that people have communities of interest they have communities of family they have communities of work they have online communities and affiliations but they don't really make a community with their neighbors they just happen to live in the houses next to each other and so i was looking for a part of london where i could where i could see those two things the, the mix of people and this thing about parallel private lives that don't really touch each other bueno, eh, realmente tampoco es que buscara un simbolismo concreto. Yo lo que pretendía era escoger una zona que me permitiese eh, mostrar esta idea de personas totalmente diferentes, provenientes incluso de países diferentes que están conviviendo en una misma zona, en una misma calle, como es el caso, pero que de hecho no forman una comunidad, a pesar de vivir juntas en la misma calle, no son una comunidad. Es muy habitual en la vida urbana que las personas generen comunidades que no son comunidades de vecinos, sino comunidades de interés es decir, personas con intereses comunes o personas que tienen una comunidad por motivos laborales o que tienen una comunidad online, pero, pero no que son comunidades de personas que viven juntas y que tengan nada en común. Y este es el hecho que quería mostrar en mi novela. Así que diría que fue más una cosa simbólica que un intento de realismo, un intento de un attempt de realism, un intento de describir almost literally describing what I could see out of, the, out of my own window. Y como, como ha dicho, no es que fuese un intento de, de simbolismo, sino más bien que era un intento de realismo, de descripción realista de lo que él puede ver desde la ventana de su casa. Thank you. Do all your characters in the novel share an equal degree of feeling for you? Yeah. Um, it's 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 difficult to describe. Um, the the way I work is I I I think I thought of this, I worked from the structure first, so in terms of the overall structure of the story, um, and, um, and then I, so I, I had this sense of what the street would feel like, and then I, I populated it with, you know, 
who do I think lives there, who do I want to live there? Um, and then I spent quite a lot of time before I began writing f imagining what the characters are like. And it was as if I, as if I spent time with them, as if, I, um, um, as if they were people I knew. Um, and so I, you, it ends up being a little bit like a real relationship. They end up being like people who are actually in your life, you know, that they're people you, you know, you could go out the door and meet one. Um, so it's sort of, it's more complicated than liking and it's more complicated than sympathy um, because there are times you don't like them, they do unlikable things, or, but it's more like they become uh, people I actually know. Um, and, you know, they become people you, you know and then you report on what they do. So the process is almost like um, they become real and then you just let them do what, they, do what they're going to do. Um, and I'd say that the kind of connection of feeling with the characters, it's, it's more like um, the connection of feeling you have with people you actually know in life. It's a, it's a mixture of different things. And the crucial step is that step that they actually come to seem real. Eh, en cuanto a los personajes, es cierto que primero mmm, tenía como la estructura de la novela en mente y más bien lo que tenía en primer lugar es como la, la, el sentido de cómo sería la calle y es como si luego a partir de ahí empezara a, a poblarla con personas, con, con personajes. Eh, realmente lo que es, el trabajo que se hace es el de imaginar en primer lugar a esos personajes, luego como pasar tiempo con ellos como si fuesen personas a las que conoces. Y al final es realmente como una verdadera relación que tienes con esos personajes, como si fueran personas a las que puedes abrir la puerta y conocer cualquier día. Y después de, de llegar a conocerles, realmente lo que haces es empezar a contar lo que hacen en su, en su vida diaria. Es un proceso por el que realmente los personajes se convierten en personas reales, en personas auténticas. Y la, la cosa va más allá de si te gustan o no te gustan. Eso no es, no es la cuestión, porque a veces realmente hacen cosas desagradables, pero eh, lo importante es que sean personas que parezcan auténticas. Um, because you can end up um, liking them more than the reader does, and it sort of throws the book out of balance. And I think one of the things that we call uh, sentimentality in works of fiction or film or whatever, it's when the feelings just feel out of proportion. It's where you feel um, you're being bullied or compelled to you know, love a character or to have a certain response to them that you don't actually feel. There's a discrepancy between what you're supposed to react, the emotions you're supposed to react with, and where you actually are. And I, I feel a sense of, um, uh, you know, it's a curious mixture of sympathy and distance um, is what, what, I, what I feel when I'm, when I'm writing. Eh, de hecho hay un cierto riesgo en que te gusten demasiado tus personajes porque esto hace que el libro quede desequilibrado eh, si te gustan demasiado tus personajes y si tienes demasiada compasión por ellos esto genera un exceso de sentimentalidad que no es, no es positivo en un libro ni en una película porque es como si el lector o el, o el espectador se viese obligado a gustarle un personaje y esto no es, no es positivo por tanto tiene que alcanzarse un equilibrio entre la simpatía por el personaje y, y la, simplemente la observación de ese personaje. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, is any character individual or do all of them create a collective character? Um, I, think, I think a little bit both um, in that um, I thought I very much think of them as um, individuals in their own right, and this point I made about parallel private lives meant that that sense of their their differences was very very important to me that um, that they um, i mean I think there's this thing you sometimes see in the mo modern world that people who live in close proximity to each other they don't actually inhabit the same kinds of space. You know, you see it in, in big cities that the, the rich and the poor are effectively inhabiting different cities. Um, and they hardly ever interact. 
Um, they might interact for, you know, when one is serving the other, or they might interact through crime, but apart from that, they're effectively in different spaces. So I really wanted to have that feeling that they're in, that everyone actually is living in a different street, um, but at the same time, the street has a collective character. Um, I think places do, I've, um, I wrote a novel about Hong Kong, and it has three, three narrators called Puerto de Aromas, and I've, I've, I really wanted the reader to feel that there were three characters tell the story, but there's actually a fourth character in the book, which is Hong Kong. And, and in this book, I, I wanted that feeling as well, that there's a, a large cast of characters about their actions, but the, the, the street is also a character too, that, um, uh, and arguably even the main character. Um, and one of the reasons the, the book ends the way it does with... Um, Roger leaving the street. Um, is I, I, I like works of art that leave you with the feeling that the characters in the place exist after the book, book or the film or the story has finished. So I wanted to leave that feeling with the reader that Peeps Road is still there. We're not, we're not watching it anymore, but it's, it's, it, it remains there even after the story has stopped. La pregunta de sobre si el personaje es individual o colectivo, yo diría que ambas cosas a la vez. Yo quería tener eh, individuos en el sentido de que son personas que viven vidas privadas en paralelo, es decir, una serie de vecinos que, a pesar de estar conviviendo juntos, realmente no habitan en el mismo lugar. Esta es una dicotomía que se ve muy clara en la, en la vida urbana actual, en la que personas ricas y personas pobres están conviviendo en el mismo espacio, pero realmente están habitando en mundos diferentes y casi nunca interactúan, excepto cuando uno es servido por otro como camarero o incluso cuando hay una situación, por ejemplo, de delitos en la calle. Eh, asimismo, el, la calle es eh, en sí misma un personaje colectivo. Esto lo podríamos ver también en otro de mis libros, en el Puerto de los Aromas, en el que hablo de Hong Kong. En este libro hay tres narradores que cuenta cada uno su, su historia, pero el cuarto narrador, desde luego, es la ciudad de Hong Kong en sí misma. Y aquí, en, en este libro, la calle Pipi's Road también es un personaje en sí mismo. De hecho, también me gusta la idea de que al final del libro, como por ejemplo en este libro, cuando Roger deja la calle, de alguna manera el, el lector tenga la sensación de que el personaje sigue existiendo y de que a su vez esa calle, Pipi's Road, va a seguir existiendo. I wanted to know if, do you think that having lived in so many places in some way has influenced your book? And if so, how? Um, I think yes is the answer. Uh, and I think in, in two ways. Um, I think uh, having moved around a lot, um, especially in early childhood, um, it, it left me with a feeling that, because the thing that was the same in all the, in all the different places was my parents, obviously, and, and the language we spoke. Um, and so it, it left me with a feeling that, um, you know, my, my home was English. You know, that that was the thing that was um, a continuous thread. And I think one of the things that you um, you know, I know lots of writers. If, you know, dentists know lots of dentists. Um, bankers know lots of bankers. Car mechanics know lots of car mechanics. Writers know lots of writers. I know lots of writers. And um, I've never met a writer who doesn't have some sense of displacement, some sense of just not quite completely fitting in and just being in some respect, slightly at odds with their surroundings. It can be gender, it can be sexuality, it can be poverty, it can be even extreme wealth. Uh, uh, it can be geographical, it can be psychological, it can be almost anything. Eh, 
me preguntas por esto yo te tengo que responder que claramente sí, yo en, en dos sentidos. En primer lugar, yo me desplacé mucho, me trasladé mucho con mis, con mis padres cuando era un niño y entonces, eh, a pesar de estar en muchos países diferentes, lo único que no cambiaba el hilo común de conexión era que mis padres siempre estaban allí y que hablábamos en inglés. Entonces, en cierta manera, el inglés era como mi hogar. Eh, por otra parte, tengo que decir que, bueno, ya sabéis que los, los médicos conocen muchos médicos, etcétera, y yo como escritor conozco a muchos escritores. Y puedo decir que todos ellos con los que he hablado me, me dicen que tienen algo en común, que es la, la sensación de desplazamiento. Es decir, todos los escritores de alguna manera sienten que no encajan con su entorno. Y esto puede ser por diversos motivos, puede ser por, por motivos de, de género o de, de elección sexual, por motivos geográficos o por motivos psicológicos, pero algo común a todos ellos es el sentido de, de extrañamiento, de desplazamiento. And, and for me, uh, that, that sense of um, displacement is geographical. It's, from, it's, it's a feeling of not quite coming from anywhere, you know, that there's no um, simple answer to that question of, for me, of, you know, where am I from, where do I belong? Um, and that's definitely um, one of the things that had, well, it's one of the reasons I'm a writer. Um, and in the case of this particular book, I think it, um, you know, London has changed very dramatically over the last 30 odd years. Um, but it's actually, it's like the story about boiling a frog, you know, if you boil a frog starting in cold water, the frog never realises it's boiling and doesn't jump out of the pot. And, and the kinds of change that have happened in London have been, have been, you know, month by month, year by year. And I think I noticed them much more because I came from somewhere else. En mi caso, mi sensación de desplazamiento es un desplazamiento geográfico. De hecho, yo puedo decir que no sé cuando me preguntan de dónde eres qué responder. No tengo una sensación clara de que pertenezca a ningún país. Y creo que ese es uno de los motivos por los que escribo, de hecho. Y con respecto a esta obra, Capital, eh, yo quería describir de alguna manera cómo la ciudad de Londres ha ido cambiando en los últimos 30 años. Lo que pasa es que este ha sido un cambio gradual, un cambio que no, no ha sucedido de repente. Es como la historia que tenemos en Inglaterra sobre que si pones a hervir una rana en agua fría y le vas calentando rápidamente el agua, hierve sin enterarse. Pues esto es lo que ha sucedido a la ciudad de Londres, que ha sido un proceso de cambio gradual, mes a mes, año tras año, en los últimos 30 años. Y quizás él, dice, se ha dado cuenta más porque venía de fuera de Londres. Y minority en London, en el último census, en 2011, it came out that the, you know, the indigenous population are less than 50%. And um, that's an unusual thing for a capital city of a state, for the native population to be in a minority. And I think I, I sort of noticed that more because of that feeling of, I've been, that's what I've been writing about. And I, I don't think I would have been as interested in that if I hadn't felt to some degree like someone who was visiting from outside. De hecho, hoy día la población blanca y británica en la ciudad de Londres se está convirtiendo en una minoría, ya son menos del 50%, lo cual es algo extraño en una capital de un estado. Y creo que yo me he dado cuenta más de este hecho precisamente porque soy escritor y porque vengo de fuera y de alguna manera me siento siempre como un visitante en Londres. Thank you. Um, do you believe that the action of this novel, I mean the drama with the social problems, could be located in any other European capital. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I mean, when I, um, when I started, um, it was a, a question that, that interested me, was whether, the, particularly this thing about there not really being a community, you know, that this, this thing that I mentioned, the parallel private lives. I was curious about whether that was a London thing, a British thing, a European thing, um, an Anglo-Saxon thing, just a condition of modern life, or just something you get in big cities. You know, it was a range of options. Um, and I was cu you know, curious to what I would, I would hear back about that. Um, and I think the answer, uh, the answer is basically, it varies. It's very different from place to place. 
Realmente no lo sé, porque eh, cuando yo empecé a escribir esta historia sobre una comunidad que no es realmente una comunidad, sino una serie de vidas en paralelo, me empecé a preguntar esto, eh, ¿por qué es así? O sea, ¿es, ¿Es algo característico de Londres o del Reino Unido o de Europa o del mundo anglosajón en general o es algo característico de la sociedad moderna o de las grandes metrópolis? Y la respuesta que hallé por el momento es que es algo que varía, depende de la ciudad. Um. I think, I think the theme, the idea that there are people from all over the world coming together in one place, that's now a thing you get in most major European capitals. You know, just this sort of press of people from troubled areas around the world arriving and this sense of, um, the, you know, the world pressing on a city. I think that's all over Europe, indeed all over the developed world, I think we get that. Um, I think the, the themes of, uh, of inequality and of inequality living in you know, very close proximity, of very good luck and very bad luck, right side by side, I think you see that everywhere. Um, I think you see a thing about society being divided into winners and losers, I think that's a common theme everywhere. Um, So all, all the things that touch on those themes, I think, would have could could be set almost anywhere. Um, I think that the funny enough, I think one of the the main themes that, that that there's only a few places it could be located though is the uh, the thing about finance. Because um, uh, people sometimes say that London London has the three F's of um, football, finance, and fashion. Um, and well, in fact, you know, you have football and fashion in lots of places. Um, uh, but um, the, 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 I think the, the thing about the, um, you know, there are two or three global capitals of finance, uh, New York, Singapore, uh, and London, London for now anyway. Um, and uh, for that, that feeling of being kind of on the edge of the precipice Uh, before the crisis, um, that I think would have been hard to get in the same way anywhere else. But so, the, the majority of it, I think, is, does apply to other places, but that, the third F is the one that would be difficult. Bueno, pienso que esa sensación de todo el mundo que se, se amontona en, en una ciudad es algo que es muy común a muchas ciudades europeas, eh, con, el, con el fenómeno de la inmigración y personas de otros países que están como eh, acumulándose o deseando avanzar todos hacia una ciudad. Eso sí que se puede encontrar en otras partes. Asimismo, esta desigualdad de personas que habitan en cercanía unos de otros, pero que son realmente muy desiguales, que son unos ricos y otros pobres, o, o claramente unos ganadores y otros perdedores, sí que es algo que se puede encontrar en, en casi todas partes hoy día. Sin embargo, yo creo que hay eh, una cosa que sí que es bastante única de Londres y de otras capitales como Nueva York y Singapur, y es el mundo de las finanzas. De hecho, decimos que en Londres hay tres Fs, que son las finanzas, el fútbol y fashion, o sea, la moda. Y a pesar de que el fútbol y la moda sí que se encuentran en otras capitales, las tres solamente, especialmente en el mundo de las finanzas, solamente en Londres, Nueva York y Singapur. Y creo que por eso es tan importante la ubicación de la novela en Londres, porque eh, en ese momento estábamos justo al borde del precipicio de la crisis financiera. Por eso escogimos esa ciudad. Do you believe that the problems that befell London in the, in the novel could also be applied to more established cities in the United States like New York or newer, more modern cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles? Uh, what's the what's the population of Madrid? Anyone know? About two million. Barcelona? Anyone know? One, two one or two million. Well, because the thing is that. Um, for which? For Madrid or Barcelona? 
in the general yeah. right so th that that the thing the reason i ask is um that we um so countries with a, a big capital city like united kingdom and spain um one of the things that doesn't translate to an American context is just how big the capital is. So you, you have Madrid having more than 10% of the population of Spain. Um, London has more has 15% of the population of the United Kingdom. So when you go down the list of American cities, you add New York to Chicago to Los Angeles to Boston to Miami to Washington to Detroit to Dallas to Houston to um, whichever ones I've left out, I mean, you, you, add, you add the list, the 30 biggest cities together, and you still don't get a city proportionately as big as London. And you could probably add the, the 25 biggest cities together before you get a city proportionately as big as Madrid. And th that's, that's the biggest difference, just that sheer concentration of all the different, all the different forces together. Um, and it's, it, it creates tensions. It creates tensions with the rest of the society around it because, um, you know, in addition to being the capital of the three Fs, football, finance, fashion, it's the cultural capital. It's where people go if they want to be artists. It's where people go if they want to have internet startups. It's where people go if they want to make films. And in, and in the United States, those are different places. If you want political power, you go to Washington. If you want to be a journalist, you go to New York. If you want to do software, you go to Silicon Valley. If you want to do films, you go to Los Angeles. You don't have that thing of one magnet attracting everyone. So that's, that's the single biggest difference. I think that um, in terms of which cities you could have the same themes in, it would have to be one that has that same sense of uh, quite a dense neighborhood. You know, you need... Um, for the feeling of this particular book, you need neighbours. And, and some cities don't have them. You know, um, uh, you know Los Angeles, it's, str it's strange to walk. Um, and you, you have a very different kind of community where, we, where it's very car-based. Um, I, um, I think there is a very good um, social novel to be written about San Francisco because it has these very particular tensions at the moment about kind of new kind of wealth and old kind of um, bohemian ways of living side by side. I think you have very interesting frictions there. And um, I think there's lots of um, interesting uh, what, what sociologists call crunchiness in New York, which is very different groups living side by side. Um, and uh, so I think those are cities where it would work. Bueno, eh, con respecto a, a Estados Unidos o, o, a, o a España, si establecemos una comparación, sería muy difícil de comparar porque las grandes capitales, tanto de España como de Londres, o sea, o sea tanto Londres como Madrid o Barcelona, concentran una gran cantidad de la población. Incluso hasta el 10 o el 15% de la población está concentrada en Madrid y en Londres. Sin embargo, en Estados Unidos la sociología es totalmente diferente. En Estados Unidos tenemos una serie, a lo mejor 20 ciudades grandes, Nueva York, Boston, Washington, Detroit, Dallas, eh, Los Ángeles, pero si sumamos la población de estas ciudades no llega a ese 15% de concentración que hay en Londres. Por tanto, eh, esta es la principal diferencia entre una gran ciudad en Estados Unidos y Londres. Creo que el hecho de que en Londres haya tal concentración de población, esto genera una serie de tensiones y de fricciones sociales que son muy interesantes. En Londres tenemos también una gran, una gran afluencia de personas, no solo del mundo de las finanzas, sino que quieren hacerse una carrera en, en el mundo cultural, en, en, no sé, en, o en Internet, en startups de Internet o en, o en la cinematografía. Por otra parte, en Estados Unidos... Todo esto estaría como desperdigado entre diferentes capitales, es decir, si quieres, si quieres eh, ser una estrella del cine te vas a Hollywood, si quieres eh, trabajar en política te vas a Washington, si quieres ser un artista te vas a Nueva York o si, o, o si eres bueno en informática Silicon Valley. Por tanto, está como más desperdigado el, el, el talento. ¿no? Y eh, hablando, por ejemplo, de la diferencia, otra diferencia entre Londres y Los Ángeles, es que en Los Ángeles realmente no se podría hacer una, una historia sobre vecinos, porque realmente no hay vecinos en Los Ángeles. La gente no camina por las calles, la gente se desplaza en coche. Por tanto, la, la, la sociología es totalmente diferente. Se podría quizás hacer una novela interesante 
desde el punto de vista social en San Francisco, porque ahí sí que hay una, una, como una tensión muy interesante entre los nuevos ricos que acaban de llegar y los, los antiguos bohemios que tradicionalmente habitaron en San Francisco. Y esto es lo que los sociólogos llaman en inglés crunchiness, que es como diferentes grupos sociales que habitan un mismo territorio. Thank you. Uh, you picture London as a cosmopolitan city. Do you think that Brexit would change the situation? I, I hope not. Um, I think part of the problem, though, is that we don't really know what Brexit is yet. You know, um, it could the the, um, the question in the referendum was too too simple, and there are a number of different models for what it would look like. And the the one that would make the most sense is an arrangement very like uh, Norway or Switzerland has, where um, there's free trade, free movement of people. Um, and it's essentially the same arrangement we have now, just without formal membership of the EU. And that, that would um, be by far the best outcome, and that would have um, no effect on the cosmopolitan mixture of London. And um, that's, the, that's the thing I, I very much hope for. Bueno, la respuesta sería, espero que no. De hecho, realmente aún no sabemos lo que es el Brexit, lo que supone, porque la pregunta que se hizo en el referéndum era demasiado sencilla, quedarse o marcharse. Entonces, yo creo que el, el tipo de arreglo que ahora no sería más, más valioso como país es un arreglo similar al que tienen Noruega o Suiza, en las que hay libre comercio y libre circulación de personas, que sería más o menos similar a lo que teníamos hasta ahora. Este sería el, el impacto más positivo del Brexit y el que tendría un menor efecto sobre el país. Um, but, the, but the problem is, we don't, you know, we can't be sure that that's the version of it we'll get. Um, and I think the, um, I think our, our government doesn't really know what they're doing. Um, it's a little bit like when someone offers to like change a tire or, or fix your Wi-Fi or something, and you start watching them and you realize after about a minute that they have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Um, and it's a very, very disconcerting feeling to have applied to something so big and so important as this. Realmente eh, no estamos seguros de lo, de lo que va a pasar y de hecho ni siquiera el gobierno tiene ni idea de lo que tiene que hacer ahora. Es como cuando alguien se te ofrece a cambiarte la rueda pinchada del coche y se pone a ello y de repente te das cuenta de que el, el señor que se ofreció no tiene ni idea, ni idea de cambiar ruedas. Entonces es como un tanto desconcertante y lo peor es que se está aplicando a un, a un tema muy serio como es dejar la Unión Europea. Um, and, um, I, I'm My fear is that we'll, we'll end up with, um, you know, accidentally having um, policies which do change the character of the city, which make it less attractive, uh, which make it less cosmopolitan, uh, and which would also make it um, more inward-looking, more nationalistic, uh, and poorer. Um, and every single one of those things would be a bad thing. Um, Uh, and I wish I could stand, you know, with my hand on my heart and guarantee that that won't be the outcome. Um, but unfortunately, I can't because um, there are so many uncertainties. And as as I say, I I, I think it's it's not at all clear that uh, that um, I was going to say our elected leaders, but actually they're not elected. It was just a change of regime because of the referendum result. Um, uh, I think it's not. It's not clear that um, the government knows what to do, and we could easily have um, a situation which really impacted London very badly. Realmente mi mayor miedo es que se, se aprueben una serie de políticas que cambien el carácter de la ciudad, que la conviertan en una ciudad menos cosmopolita, menos atractiva para, para las personas que van allí y que la conviertan en una, en una urbe más nacionalista y, y más pobre. Esto es, sería lo peor que podría pasar de ese referéndum. Y de hecho, eh, este, el resultado de ese referéndum ha supuesto como un auténtico cambio de régimen para, para Inglaterra. Y bueno, esto es lo, lo peor que podría suceder para, para Londres. Thank you. Do you agree with the idea that crisis 
shows how human uh, bases themselves in capital average, in other words, in money. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think all forms of crisis do. I think many forms of crisis bring out the, 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 best, in, the best in people. Um, you, often see what, you often see what people are like, and in a way you often see what yourself are, are like most when things are very difficult. Um, and perhaps, especially when they're unexpectedly difficult, um, you, can learn, you can learn a lot about a person seeing them in a, in a state of crisis. I think that there's a particular thing, though, um, in the world of finance. I think um, so I, I got interested in finance, and I ended up educating myself about it when I started writing this book, because I realized early on, I wanted to write about London, but I realized that I couldn't write about London unless I knew about finance and economics, just because it had become so important. And it had actually, it was finance that determined, not as a metaphor, but literally, you know, who lived in the house next door. Uh, and I realized I knew nothing at all about it, so I had to find out about it. Bueno, eh, no, yo no creo que la crisis automáticamente signifique que aumente la avaricia de las personas. De hecho, en algunas, en muchas ocasiones, las crisis sacan lo mejor de nosotros mismos y son una oportunidad para conocerte mejor a ti mismo en circunstancias difíciles. Y es en esas circunstancias difíciles donde realmente aprendes cosas sobre ti mismo. Pero eh, hablando sobre, sobre esta crisis financiera, yo cuando tuve que empezar a leer, o perdón, a escribir mi libro, realmente tuve que educarme a mí mismo sobre el tema de las finanzas, del, del tema que yo no sabía absolutamente nada. Las finanzas son tan importantes en Londres que de hecho determinan quién es tu vecino, de quién es la casa que está junto a la tuya. Y todo este tema pues, es algo que tuve que aprender para el libro. Um, and one of the things that you learn in, in the world of finance and economics is that um, things are always new because there's always some new angle, some new crisis, some new, some clever new financial device that's just exploded. Um, so there's always novelty. And yet there are things that are always permanently true at the same time. You have this strange thing of news, new stories which are actually also old stories. And, and the oldest story of all is that the, the forces that drive, the economic forces that are most important, especially in crisis, are greed and fear. And that they both are always exaggerated. So on the way up, people get too greedy. And then when they panic and things start going down, people get too frightened. And you know, that was, it's been true, um, I think it's true in all places and in all times that in, in market-based um, societies, and maybe it's just a principle of human nature, um, greed and fear are the, the dominant economic forces. Bueno, cuando estudias las finanzas aprendes que hay un montón de dispositivos financieros muy inteligentes que se van sucediendo. Algunos son dispositivos nuevos, otros son eh, viejas historias que se van como reformando para servir a los intereses de las finanzas. Pero básicamente eh, lo más importante que hay que conocer es que hay dos fuerzas fundamentales que mueven el mundo en todas partes, que son la avaricia y el miedo. Y tanto la avaricia como el miedo se ven exageradas en un momento de crisis, es decir, cuando las cosas van mejor, cuando las cosas van subiendo, aumenta la avaricia de todo el mundo. Y cuando las cosas empiezan a declinar, a descender, aumenta el miedo de todo el mundo. Y estos son, estas dos fuerzas son las que realmente están moviendo e impulsando las sociedades de mercado. Y una de las cosas, you know, cuando empecé a escribir el libro, tenía una muy strong feeling de que había una bubble que estaba about to pop. Y ese fue el momento que quería capturar, fue ese momento de uh, obliviousness. Y eso es una cosa que. You know, my, my father, who worked for a bank, he used to say, all you need to be an investment genius is a short memory and a rising market. And that's what, that's what London was like. And I wanted to capture this moment just before this bubble of greed and obliviousness popped. Um, and I didn't realize it would be a kind of global bubble, and I didn't realize how frightening it would be when it did pop. Um, but, but that moment of... Um, of obliviousness does it does seem to be something in human nature you know because i've lived through two crashes like like that in london you know just in my lifetime and we do seem to have a kind of deep will 
to ignore warning signs. Um, I, that seems to be a kind of just a fact of the way we're wired. Sí, yo quería capturar en, en mi libro el momento justo en el que explota esa burbuja. Y eso es lo que yo denomino también el momento del olvido. Porque el, el olvido es muy importante cuando trabajas en finanzas. Mi propio padre dice, eh, trabajaba en un banco y él me contó que todo lo que te necesitabas para tener éxito en el mundo del, de la banca es un mercado al alza y una mala memoria. Y realmente es cierto, porque las personas tenemos esta tendencia a olvidar los momentos de crisis cuando las cosas van bien. Y eso es lo que yo quería capturar en, en, en mi novela, ese momento justo antes de que estalla la burbuja. De hecho, creo que es una tendencia de la naturaleza humana esta tendencia a olvidar lo malo por, y a ignorar a sí mismo las señales de aviso, como sucedió en esa ocasión. Yo mismo he asistido ya en mi, en mi, en mi espacio vital a dos eh, crashes de este tipo en Londres, con lo cual parece una tendencia humana habitual. Uh, do you think that art should strive to change the society in which it is produced? Thank you. I think um, I think that's one of the things art can can and should do. Um, I my I don't think it's the only thing art can do. I I think of um, there's a, a a very unfashionable English philosopher called Michael Oakeshott. Um, and he had this idea that the, all the, dis the human disciplines, philosophy, poetry, history, um, uh, I'd add economics to that, um, are, um, the metaphor he used was conversations. They're ways of humanity talking to ourselves, talking to each other, and it functions across geography and across culture and across time. So we, when you study the thinkers of the past, you're engaged in this long conversation that humanity is constantly keeps having with itself. And you know, rather than thinking of these things as disciplines or things that have certain rules or certain compulsions or things they must do, um, I, I like the metaphor of art as a as a conversation because it's inclusive and it makes clear that there are. Um, many different kinds of art and that all art takes, takes its place in this sort of long sequence of conversations. Um, and one of those conversations can be the imperative, imperative to change. La, la respuesta sería sí, pero no solamente. Eh, a mí me gusta mucho un filósofo inglés que se llama Michael Lotshot, que no es muy conocido, pero a mí me, me parece interesante, y él decía que la filosofía, la poesía, la historia y yo añado, y también la economía, son como conversaciones entre las personas. Y yo creo que esto es cierto, es decir, nosotros estudiamos la filosofía para entrar dentro de esta conversación, que es como una secuencia eh, temporal de, de, de diálogo entre las personas. Yo no creo realmente que haya disciplina separada, sino que el arte es una conversación y que todas las formas de arte forman parte de esta, de esta conversación entre las personas. Um, but there, of course, there are artists who just see it as a business uh, and who regard it purely. I mean, an art business is a, quite a big thing in London. Um, and that was one of the things I wanted to um, have some fun with in the book. So the character of Smitty is very much someone who, who comes from that world and he's effectively, um, uh, he thinks of himself as an artist, but I think from the reader's point of view, it's more like he's, a, he's an entrepreneur or businessman who just is, happens to use art as his way of making money. De hecho, también hay otras personas. Oops. Hay otras personas que sin embargo ven el arte como un negocio, como cualquier otro negocio y de hecho en Londres es muy frecuente este negocio del arte y el personaje de Smith es, es una de esas personas. Yo me reí bastante con este personaje que concebía totalmente el arte como un negocio, como su manera de ganar dinero. Para él el arte es un negocio. Um, in your novel, you present different characters, including a, a family from Pakistan. Um, do you have any particular reason for choosing this particular nationality? Well, 
But um, this is an example of something that um, there are things in novels that you can draw from real life, and there are things that don't quite work in books. And so um, there are lots of shops on corners in the UK. It's a common feature of urban geography that you have a shop on the corner. And it's very often a family of Indian or Pakistani or subcontinental origin. And I, I, I did want to have a shop like that. Um, and in, in real life, um, the, the shop nearest me, um, and it's where I got the idea of the three brothers, because there were three brothers who worked in the shop. Um, and they were Afghan. They were Afghan, they were middle class refugees from the Taliban. Um, and, um, and, they had a, and they would often argue, and they had a property back in Kabul. And they would often argue about what price to sell it at, because the US Army was buying up lots of property in Kabul. Uh, and there was a family argument about when to sell to make the most advantage out of the rising ha housing prices in Kabul. Eh, es cierto, en, en Inglaterra probablemente sabéis que hay muchas tiendas de la esquina que están gestionadas o que son propiedad de personas del subcontinente indio, ya sea indios, pakistaníes, etc. De hecho, en, en mi propia calle, en la esquina, hay una de estas tiendas gestionada por tres hermanos que son de origen afgano, que son refugiados del, eh, que huyeron de los talibanes en Afganistán. Y eh, ellos a menudo tienen esta conversación sobre su casa en Kabul, tienen una propiedad en Kabul que desean vender y eh, bueno, la, el ejército americano está adquiriendo propiedades, etc. Entonces es una discusión que tienen sobre el precio de, de venta de la casa. Um, so I, I thought about putting them in the book, but it was too distracting. The Afghan thing, it was kind of too interesting. You almost wanted to read a whole book just about the house in Kabul. Um, and so I decided I wanted to keep the, the three siblings taking turns behind the counter of this small shop. And the, they had different levels of religious observance. And I, I was interested by that and I wanted to keep that. Um, but I thought, no, they can't be Afghani because it's too strange. Um, sometimes sort of surprising things can be distracting in a novel. Um, and um, uh, so on balance, I, because, you know, demographically, the. Um, in that shop, in that part of London, the, the most likely thing would be that they would be from Pakistan. Um, so I, in the end, I, I, went, I went for that. Um, uh, mainly, um, I, di I didn't in general try to make the novel representative, but there were a couple of moments where I, um, the fact that the, the builder working in the street is Polish, and the fact that the family in the shop are Pakistani are points where I just thought, you know, I'm going to go with the thing that um, is most common in London. Bueno, de hecho yo no, no quise decir que los hermanos que, que tienen la tienda son afganos porque me parecía demasiado algún elemento de distracción para el lector porque sería como demasiado interesante, demasiado extraño y me, me desviaría el lector. Por tanto, lo que sí mantuve y que es real es que son tres hermanos que, que llevan la tienda y que tienen diferentes niveles de religiosidad, de menos a más. Y eh, quise mantenerlo así porque demográficamente... En Londres, eh, la mayor parte de estas tiendas de la esquina son propiedad de personas pakistaníes. Y también hay otro elemento que es realista, que es el, el albañil polaco, que es algo muy frecuente también que se encuentra en, en la sociedad de Londres. Thank you. Oh. When you wrote Capital, did you want to influence the society? Uh, the great American writer James Baldwin he said that the way, the way writers change the world is by changing the way people see the world. So you can't, you can't go out, you don't have a lever to pull out in the world, but you can change the way people perceive, the way people see. Um, I've always thought that was um, a very powerful idea, um, that, and in terms of, I think, the kinds of effects books have, that's the kind of effect I think they can have. Eh, hay un gran escritor estadounidense que se llama Baldwin que tiene una frase que dice la manera en que el escritor cambia el mundo es cambiando la manera en que la gente ve el mundo y eso me parece una idea muy fuerte, muy potente que quise mantener y en la que creo. Um, but I think I, I was very interested, I wanted to make people see just how 
woven into the fabric of the city, um, this thing about immigration is. Um, at, at an early stage of writing the book, um, I had thought about having all the characters being immigrants. And, you know, the, the book would never discuss that. It would never be um, kind of an overt point, but just that every single person in the book would have come from somewhere else. Um, and I, I didn't do... Th I s abandoned that idea because I thought it would be too obviously didactic, too obviously preachy. Um, but I did want to um, just catch this change that I'd, I'd seen in London over 30 years, um, which is the fact of, you know, just everybody is from somewhere else. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to make readers see that fact about the world around them more clearly through, through reading the book. Realmente eh, uno de los propósitos de esta novela es hacer que la gente se dé cuenta de hasta qué punto la inmigración está tan presente en Londres. De hecho, cuando empecé el libro tenía la idea de hacer que todos y cada uno de los personajes fuesen inmigrantes. Luego abandoné esta idea porque me pareció como demasiado didáctica para el lector y no, no me gustó. Pero simplemente sí que mantuve la idea de reflejar eh, los cambios que se han sucedido en Londres a lo largo de, estas, de estos últimos 30 años y, como, y dejar esta idea muy clara en, en la mente del lector. Pero, um, you know, there are... You can have very... You can have many unintended consequences, though because um, and the kind of explicit purpose of a book can actually can rebound because you know it's it's arguable a thing like the brexit vote um, it's arguable but lots of people realize that very well and instead of thinking it as a positive thing they regarded it as a, actually a negative so um, uh, you know if you um, want to change the world you have to be careful because sometimes you, you know maybe you do and maybe it doesn't work out the way you want Asimismo también el libro puede tener una serie de consecuencias impre imprevistas que, que te reboten en la cara. Eh, es, es, a, a veces como el, el objetivo explícito del libro realmente puede que, que vaya en tu contra. Es una cosa similar a lo que pasó con el resultado del referéndum del Brexit. La gente ahora se está dando cuenta de que a veces cuando consigues lo que deseabas en primer lugar no era eso lo que estabas intentando conseguir. Um, which role does the reader play in the book? I, I don't think about the reader in the sense of I don't imagine um, a specific reader. I don't think about, you know, uh, oh, she'll like this bit, she won't like that bit, but she'll like that bit and then she'll be worried here, and then it'll be a happy ending, and she'll be happy. Um, so I don't, I don't th kind of think of the reader um, as a kind of, um, as like an instrument I'm playing, which I know some writers do. Um, but I think of the, um, I, I th but I think of the book as a, a mechanism that has to work in particular ways uh, in order to, um, I don't know, it's like a car having to be engineered in a certain way in order to run or a chair having to be made in a certain way in order to, for it to be able to carry somebody's weight. Um, it's like a, an object or a mechanism. Bueno, realmente yo cuando pienso en un lector no me imagino a un lector específico ni me imagino a quién lector se va a poner contento porque pasa esto o aquí va a pasar esto que no le va a gustar nada pero al final va a quedar muy satisfecho con el final del libro. Eso no, yo no lo hago así, no imagino así al lector. Para mí el lector no es un instrumento que tocar como piensan otros autores, yo no, yo no lo hago así. Para mí, sin embargo, el libro sí que tiene que funcionar en un sentido de que tenga como un mecanismo que le haga funcionar. Igual que un coche está, está diseñado por los ingenieros de una manera concreta para que luego el resultado sea que funcione. And, and actually, in a way, the reader is implicit in that, because if you're making, if you're making a car, that's in order for someone to drive it. 
and if you're making a chair that's in order for someone to sit in or a table is in order for someone to, to use and that's the sense in which the reader is present that they're um, you know the, the the person for whom the mechanism is uh, is is made um, uh, but yeah I, I did write a novel my second novel mr. Phillips has a thing where um, there's a kind of trajectory of feelings that I wanted the reader to have to in a sense, it's really about being drawn gradually closer to the character um, but and that that wasn't the case with this book it was more to do with this thing about um, um, you know I built this thing in a certain way and then handed it over to to you to you know um, and now it's your thing bueno, de alguna manera el, el lector está implícito en el libro, igual que un, en cuando diseñas un coche, el conductor del coche está implícito que tiene que encajar en ese coche, o cuando eh, montas una silla está implícito que tiene que soportar el peso de la persona que se sienta en ella. En ese sentido, el libro también funciona como un mecanismo. Eh, escribí otro de mis libros, que es el señor Phillips, en el que el mecanismo era diferente. Ahí se representaba como una trayectoria de sentimientos que lograban que el lector se fuese aproximando cada vez más al personaje. Sin embargo, en Capital el mecanismo es diferente. Está montado de, de cierta manera para que el lector vaya acompañando esa evolución. Thank you. How and when did you have the idea of writing this book? Um, it was in um, about the late 2005, early 2006. Um, and um, I, th I, I sort of wanted to write a novel about London. Um, I wanted to, and I, um, there's an old, there's an old uh, story told about a man in a pub uh, that he a, there's a, a man claimed to have overheard a conversation in the pub, two people talking to each other, and the first man said, I'm writing a novel, and the second man said, neither am I. Bueno, eh, la idea me surgió eh, como a finales del 2005, principios del 2006. Mi idea era la de escribir un libro sobre Londres. Hay una, una historia que corre por ahí en Inglaterra que eh, hay dos hombres eh, charlando en un pub y uno dice, estoy escribiendo una novela, y el otro le contesta, yo tampoco. Y así es mi método de trabajo, method, really. Hay mucho de no trabajar en el principio. Y estaba mirando la ventana, literalmente mirando la ventana. And, and it's the scene with which the book starts. It's looking at the delivery vans and then dog walkers and builders and then more delivery vans. And the image that came to me was as if the houses were like, were like people with all these services being given to them. The houses were like rich people. And I remember thinking, actually, this can't go on. This is a sign of a bubble. You know, I remember the last bubble and this is what it feels like. Um, and that you know that there's bound to be a downturn or a crash of of some kind and um that was the sort of that was the opening moment of the book for me this this feeling that um that we know something that the characters in the book don't know which is about that the whole thing is about to go pop de alguna manera, esto que contaba del pub es un poco mi metodología de trabajo, que es la de no trabajar al comienzo de la escritura, simplemente observar. En este caso estaba observando por mi ventana lo que sucedía por la calle, es decir, las furgonetas de reparto que llegaban, los obreros que estaban haciendo reformas, más furgonetas de reparto que seguían llegando. Y de esta manera era como si las casas en sí mismas fueran como personas a las que se les prestaban servicios, como si fueran personas ricas. Y yo pensé, esto no puede seguir así, esto es una burbuja que inminentemente va a estallar porque no, no es sostenible. Y ahí es cuando realmente me di cuenta de que se acercaba una recesión. Y esta también es una idea del libro que nosotros sabemos, nosotros los lectores y el escritor, que todo va a estallar por los aires, pero los personajes que están en el libro no lo saben, no se dan cuenta. Um, ¿Es una you know, a dramatic irony? ¿Es un term que usas? Una dramatic irony es cuando los actores no saben algo, pero la audiencia lo sabe. Y para mí, eso fue el 
the the starting point of the book was this dramatic irony about um, about obliviousness that we talked about earlier um, that they don't know this thing is about to happen and and we do and um, and then it was strange because when I was writing the book the crash happened and it and it was much you know it was real and it was more frightening than I'd imagined because I thought it was just house prices going down a bit um, and so um, you know I I got the dramatic irony I I I basically gambled the whole book on but it, but it, and then it sort of turned into something more systemic and and wider no sé si conocéis esta técnica que se llama la ironía dramática que consiste en que el lector de un libro o el espectador de una obra sabe que está pasando algo pero los personajes que están dentro no lo saben esta es una técnica que yo utilicé también en este libro yo de alguna manera sabía que, que iba a haber una auténtica recesión una recesión que iba más allá de una caída de precios inmobiliarios yo sabía que era algo mucho más gordo una burbuja que iba a estallar pero los personajes no se enteraban y es, ahí reside esa ironía dramática Thank you. Uh, in your novel, we can see different stories that join together at the end. Was this your original idea, or maybe was this something that came up during the writing process? And did you know from the beginning how you were going to end the story? Um, it, it, was, um, it was very much... Um, for, for me, I get the thing that a, a, sto a story and how to tell the story and who tells the story are sort of all one question. They're all, that's the problem to solve in writing a novel. If you know who's telling it, you, in a way you also know what the story is and you know how to tell it, you know, because the character teaches you how to tell the story. Um, and the things that I wanted to have in this book where I wanted to have a kind of objective narrator, a narrator who is above the characters, and I wanted to have a large cast of characters who sort of rub along next to each other, um, and I wanted to have the one street. So those were the sort of, um, those were the three items that I, I, th I threw into the blender together. Um, and that was the thing that took uh, the most work. It took as much time planning the book as it took actually writing it. Eh, eh, realmente yo estoy jugando en, en cualquier libro con, con tres ideas, que es por una parte la historia, cómo se cuenta y quién la cuenta, pero realmente si sabes quién cuenta la historia ya tienes la historia de alguna manera y ya sabes cómo se va a, a desarrollar. En este libro encontramos esos tres elementos, que son el narrador, un conjunto de personajes que están eh, tocándose unos a otros, interactuando, y la calle, que sería el tercer elemento. De hecho, en este libro me llevó tanto tiempo la planificación como su propia escritura. And I, I had a, a, a program I use called Scrivener. I used to use um, index cards, um, but now I have a computer program that lets you um, pin index cards on it. And I, I move them around to have the sequence of the the kind of rhythm of moving between the characters so um from you know the the rhythm in which you'd move between chapters from one character to another um i spent a lot of time planning that because i that was a very that was kind of um for me that was the the technical thing that i was interested in in the book um and it fol and the ending very much followed from that um, I wanted to have a feeling that you had this sort of sequence of things with the characters and there were resolutions to the different stories um, but there was this distinct other feeling at the end. Bueno, la, la, la técnica con la que yo trabajo, al principio trabajaba con, con fichas, con fichas de trabajo y ahora utilizo un programa que se llama Scrivener que es como en el que puedes colocar como las fichas sobre la pantalla de ordenador y moverlas, desplazarlas según la secuencia de eventos que tú quieras generar. Es, y de esta manera es como se fue generando el ritmo de los capítulos uno tras otro. Todo este trabajo es el que lleva más tiempo de planificación y realmente me gustó mucho trabajar de esa manera. Y en cuanto al final, realmente era como la consecuencia lógica 
de dar resolución a, la, a las historias consecutivas que se fueron sucediendo. Um, and so I didn't have the uh, specific ending in mind until quite a long way in, but I knew the feeling I wanted the ending to have. It was the feeling I spoke about earlier about, uh, it, it's like as in a film where um, the last shot, it doesn't go black, it's just that the camera pans away, you know, and you, you're left with the feeling that the characters and the place is still there. It's just that the, character's atten you know, the camera's attention has gone somewhere else. Um, and that was the kind of note I wanted to catch with the ending. That was more, it was the feeling more than the exact, you know, plot point that it ended with that was w what I had in mind. Por tanto, no tenía el final específico en mente cuando comencé a escribir, pero sí tenía el sentimiento que quería transmitir. Eh, como os he dicho anteriormente, me gusta ese sentimiento de que el, la historia continúa, de que los personajes continúan. No es como en una película en la que ves una, una pantalla en negro y ahí se acaba todo, sino que más bien, si fuera cinematografía, sería como un movimiento de cámara gradual desplazándose de la escena, pero nosotros sabemos que la escena va a seguir desarrollándose ahí. Thank you. Did you get the inspiration from any author in order to present your characters? Thank you. Um, I, I was very, I read a lot of, and I thought a lot about um, 19th century writers. Um, Dickens, Trollope, Austen, George Eliot, Flaubert, Zola. Um, Uh, and I suppose, you know, Tolstoy, the you know, 19th century realists, um, mainly because I realized that I'd written three novels and that they were very preoccupied by a kind of mo a modern set of questions about point of view and technique. And, you know, if this person is telling the story, what does that character know? What's that character's perspective? And what are the rules? And things like that. And I suddenly realized that if I was writing you know, 150 years ago, if I was writing in 1850, I would have more freedom. I would say, you know, who cares what the characters know? I'm, I'm God, I'm the author, I can make them do anything they want. I, can, I know everything. Um, and if I, you know, if I want to be completely omniscient and, um, you know, bully my characters and, and know everything about them, and if I want to start sermonizing direct to the reader, I can do any of those things I want. Uh, and it was a strange thought, I thought, hang on, if I was doing this 150 years ago, we think we have more freedom and more, but actually they had more permission, more, more freedom in a kind of technical sense. Bueno, eh, me basé en muchos autores que me gustan, autores realistas del siglo XIX, como Dickens, Flaubert, Austen, Tolstoy, Zola, todos estos autores me, me, me fueron una fuente de inspiración. Y de hecho me, me di cuenta de pronto de que yo había escrito ya tres novelas que estaban muy preocupadas, todas ellas, con temas técnicos, con temas de puntos de vista, seguir muy claramente las reglas modernas de escritura. Y de pronto me di cuenta como que si yo estuviese escribiendo en 1850, hace 150 años, de hecho tendría mucha más libertad que en el momento actual. Porque en ese momento podría tener un narrador completamente omnisciente, que lo sabe todo sobre sus personajes, que incluso se, se permite el, el, la libertad de sermonear al lector directamente y que, que se da como muchos más permisos al escritor en ese momento. Y eso es un poco lo que yo quería hacer ahora con esta novela con Capital. And, and uh, it actually, it ended up being interesting, the, pr the, free, the permission I didn't take. And there were two things that um, I, I sort of, um, I, permissions that I awarded myself that I didn't actually use. And one was that the English novel, uh, not the French or Russian or any of the other, but is very pre preoccupied with kind of moral accountancy, with the, the end of it, the 19th century. You know exactly what you're supposed to think about who's good and who's bad, and did they get their reward, did they get their punishment, tick, cross, A, B, nine out of ten, they're, and it's all kind of, they're like butterflies in a collection, they're pinned down morally, that you know what you're supposed to think and what their value is. And I didn't want to do that, I wanted to leave it more open. And the, and the other thing that I, permission I, I didn't take, was the thing I just spoke about, about the sermon direct to the reader. I found that I couldn't, It did, just didn't feel 
relevant or to talk to the reader in, in that way anymore. I didn't feel it was uh, something that sort of um, I could make feel alive. Eh, sin embargo, hay dos permisos que yo no me, no me permití, por así decirlo. Eh, por un lado, la novela inglesa está siempre muy preocupada con el tema de la moralidad, es decir, es como un recuento moral que se hace al final, en el sentido de que los buenos tienen que obtener su recompensa y los malos tienen que ser castigados. Entonces, al final casi tienes que dar como un informe diciendo el bueno, premio, X, o el, el malo, castigo, sí, conseguido, tal. Entonces, en ese sentido, yo no, yo no hice eso, yo mantuve el final mucho más abierto. Y el otro permiso que se tomaba en el 19 y que yo no me permití fue el de sermonear o predicar al lector. Thank you. So, um, as a journalist, how has your job impact in the language and in the content of the book? Thank you. Um, well, uh, not much actually, um, and funnily enough what happened is, is the other way around, it's that because I started finding out about finance and economics in order to write, about, write capital, write about London, and then, um, then the crash happened, and so I started writing journalistically about economics and the crash, um, thinking it would be a kind of temporary thing, and you know, ten years later I'm still doing it. Um, so you know, it was a strange thing that actually the, the novel um, took over my journalistic work and, and um, you know, is still, is still running it to this day. I, it's slightly odd, but I'm, it's as if I'm an employee of my own book. Bueno, eh, realmente no mucho, no mucho, porque yo lo que, lo que tuve que hacer es empezar a estudiar finanzas para poder escribir la novela y en ese momento sucedió la gran recesión económica, con lo cual eh, encajó perfectamente. De hecho, en mi trabajo como periodista me encontré diez años después escribiendo sobre el tema de la crisis económica, que era, que era justo lo que se representaba en la novela. Entonces, es como si la novela se hubiese apoderado de mi trabajo como periodista, lo cual tiene, tiene gracia. And, and actually, I, I work quite hard to keep the journalism out of the novel, because I, when I finished the first draft of Capital, um, by that point, I actually knew quite a lot about, about banking and about the crisis. Um, and I always leave a gap between finishing a book for the first time and then going back and writing it, you know, finishing it again. And I thought that... It, there was a risk that I would end up putting up too much of the research in the book. Uh, I'd end up putting up too much technical stuff about banking, and you'd end up with a thing. Uh, in science fiction, they call it, tell me, professor, where you know one character turns to the other and say, tell me, professor, why does the quantum warp, blah, 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 and then the, the character answers, and it's really boring. Because um, it's very boring to explain in, in fiction. You know, um, you can do most things in fiction, but you can't really explain complicated technical things without killing the story. Um, so, in fact, what I ended up doing is I ended up writing in, in quite, in four months, I wrote a book about the credit crunch. It was published in Spain afterwards. It's called Uy in Spanish. But actually, I wrote it before um, in order just to put all the research somewhere else so that I didn't have characters standing around you know, explaining collateralized debt obligations to each other in ways that just wouldn't work in a novel. Bueno, eh, de hecho, para el momento en que ya fina, había finalizado el primer borrador de la novela, que siempre escribo primero un primer borrador, yo sabía muchísimo sobre banca y finanzas. Luego siempre dejo como un pequeño espacio después del primer borrador para volver a, a reescribir esa novela. Y al final de ese momento yo había acumulado una gran cantidad de investigación sobre el tema de la crisis financiera Y, y yo podría aportar una enorme cantidad de datos técnicos al respecto. Sin embargo, no quería hacerlo porque esto sería muy aburrido para el lector. En las películas de ciencia, de ciencia ficción tienen este, este momento que le llaman «Tell me, professor», «Cuénteme, profesor», es decir, cuando, el, cuando se pone a explicar el, el personaje la teoría de cuántica de manera muy elaborada y muy aburrida. Yo quería evitar totalmente esta sensación de aburrimiento para el lector. Y de hecho lo que hice fue escribir el, la novela Uy, porque todo el mundo debe y nadie paga, que no es una novela, sino más bien un ensayo. 
y la escribí para poder concentrar ahí en ese ensayo todo el conocimiento técnico que había acumulado sobre el tema de las finanzas y no volcarlo en capital porque sería muy aburrido Thank you. Do you think that perfection, the exact words that reflect what you want to express, need time to mature, or the first and snapshot ideas are the best? Thank you. Well, I, I, just, I in a way, I try to get both um, things in the books. I spend a lot of time thinking about the structure. Um, you know, so I'm a, I'm a. Writers t tend to either plan or live day by day, you know, and there's no rules. It's like half and half, and they both seem very strange if you're the other kind of writer. Um, so I know Zadie Smith, for instance. Zadie Smith doesn't know anything about her books when she sits down to write just the first sentence, um, and I think that's crazy, and she thinks I'm crazy because I plan it all out. So there's no rule for doing it. Everybody's different. Bueno, eh, yo lo que hago en primer lugar es pensar en la estructura del libro. Sabéis que hay dos tipos principales de escritores, los que planifican con anterioridad y los que improvisan totalmente. Eh, Sadie Smith, a la que conozco, es del, del tipo segundo, es decir, eh, Sadie cuando se sienta ante la mesa a escribir no tiene ni idea de qué va a escribir en su libro. Uh, I don't go back, I don't revise, and the first draft I just go forwards. So uh, I keep the, the forward momentum, um, and uh, if I have thoughts about something I wrote earlier, I make a note, but I don't go back and change it. Just I keep that forward momentum, um, because actually I think the first thought is very, very precious, it's very important, and it's easy to overcomplicate and and overanalyze um, so I try and do both I, I tr think as much as I can in order to then have that feeling of just going through it in one go yo, eh, eh, yo personalmente planifico todo lo que puedo de hecho lo que hago es comenzar y em empiezo a escribir y no reviso lo que he escrito en el primer borrador simplemente continúo y continúo con el impulso de escribir si me doy cuenta de que hay algo que me lo he saltado pues simplemente hago una nota para volver sobre eso luego, pero continúo escribiendo. Para mí, la, la frescura de este primer pensamiento es crucial, es importantísima y quiero mantenerla. Pero, por otra parte, sí que planifico mucho con anterioridad, todo lo que puedo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, time is over and we want to finish with a huge applause for you. And thank you, and you will always be welcome here. Thank you very much. Thank you.